Hi, welcome. I am Dr. Peter Platchan, the director of the George Mason University Observatory. Uh, we're going to get started with some preliminaries while we uh, uh, have people slowly trickle in. Um, if you'd like more information about our observatory, you can find us on the web internet at uh, science.gmu.edu slash observatory. You can follow us on Twitter at GMU Observatory. And if you have any questions or like to give us some feedback, you can reach us at GMU Observatory at gmail.com. Uh, so these uh, events that you're joining tonight are, are free. We, are, we hold them alternating Thursday evenings every other week during the school year, during the academic year at George Mason University. Our next session is going to be October 8th, and our speaker is going to be Dr. Varjan Gorian from uh, NASA JPL. And normally, we like to hold these events in person, uh, but during the pandemic, these events will be virtual. Uh, and we hope you're all safe and healthy and uh, joining us uh, uh, and, and enjoy it and we'll enjoy the talk tonight. Uh, so we're going to have a talk uh, appropriate for all ages and interests that will be followed by a guided telescope tour of that night sky. Unfortunately, tonight the humidity is a little bit high and clouds are rolling in, uh, but we will keep an eye on the conditions. And if the conditions do improve, we will open up uh, and take a look at some quick objects tonight. Um, we do ask uh, for your feedback on uh, tonight's show, and we're going to paste a link in the chat later uh, to, um, sorry, it keeps advancing the slides on me. Uh, we're going to paste a link in the chat later um, uh, to a survey about tonight's event. So here's a picture of our observatory. It's atop the roof of Research Hall on the Fairfax campus of George Mason University. There's a dome that you see where the telescope is and the control room. Um, in the, on top of the building as well. Inside the control room, we have computers to control the telescope, and we're actually going to be connecting to one of those computers tonight to show you our virtual view of the night sky. And in better conditions, you can see some of the views that we have captured uh, with students um, uh, over the, uh, of the night sky of various objects, including nebula, galaxies, and clusters of stars. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter. Our next edition will be coming out in a few days. Please sign up uh, to get this newsletter for information about future events. Uh, we have a, a focus in the October issue on uh, uh, is there life on Venus? You may have heard about that in the news. Uh, and there's just some great information there. It's called The Moon, and you can sign up on our website. Uh, we'd also invite you to become a patron of the observatory and make a philanthropic contribution. Uh, that is tax deductible, provide critical support for the observatory activities, uh, as well as to continue all the students that we have uh, that use this observatory on a daily basis. We have different membership levels, uh, ranging from a star member uh, up to the Big Bang, uh, including cluster nova, supernova, and galaxy members. And we'd just like to thank our Big Bang galaxy supernova patrons, as well as our new nova cluster and star members. Uh, as I said, I'm the director of the observatory. We also have Professor Rob Parks, who's the new deputy director of the observatory, and he'll be joining us uh, in future sessions. Tonight, we're joined by our two graduate student observatory teaching assistants, Justin Wittrock and William Matsko, who will assist us tonight with the remote telescope viewing session. We have Brandon Iverson, who's the president of our student club, Friends of the Observatory. If you're a student here at Mason, you can uh, find that on Mason 360 and, and join that club. Uh, there's no cost to join the club. And we have a number of tour guides who uh, give virtual tours this semester to the observatory to over a thousand students uh, per year and, and the general public. So once again, you can find more information about us at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. Follow us on Twitter, email us, and we will paste a link to this form in a little bit. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Benny Hal Um He is um, a professor at the um, University of Louisville in Kentucky. And uh, sorry for the slide jump again. Uh, he studied astronomy, astronomy at uh, Groningen University and did his uh, PhD work with Ron Allen at the Space Telescope Science Institute uh, and then graduated at the Capitan Institute in Groningen. Uh, after that, he did a postdoctoral scholar uh, position 
uh, with uh, Roloff de Jong and Danielle Calzetti at the Space Telescope Science Institute, followed by a postdoc at the University of Cape Town, uh, working on the Meerkat radio telescope. He did, an, did a European Space Agency fellowship in the Netherlands and a postdoc at Leiden Observatory. Uh, so he's had a lot of international moves. So if you're looking to move internationally anytime soon, you can ask him in the Q&A for some advice on that. Uh, and in 2017, he moved to his current position as an associate professor. So without further ado, I introduce tonight's speaker. Okay. So hi, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm uh, I'm Ben Holverda, um, and I uh, I'm going to talk about a project that I've been working with uh, a whole bunch of people that you see listed here: Rupali Chandar, who I know from Space Telescope, Pauline Barmby, Savit Ford, uh, and Jeremy Balin, and then several students. Um, sorry, Molly, Molly Peebles is also at Space Telescope. Uh, and then uh, basically the bottom line is all our undergrads that have been working on, uh, on and off on this, uh, on this project. Uh, so first thing I saw was that I have to squash the whole thing about this being the Godzilla galaxy uh, that snuck into our press release somehow and people have been calling it the Godzilla galaxy. And really, I don't think of it as Godzilla. I think of it as the gentle giant. It is... Um, quite the opposite as a big monster it is uh it's very very gentle and so why do i call it rubens galaxy um we've named this after uh vera rubin she uh recently passed away in 2016 and um this seemed like a very good tribute uh to uh to her work so first thing is that she published one of two um kind of often cited very definitive studies that there is dark matter in galaxies from how they rotate. And you can see how she, she's uh, using, well, she's posing here because it's in, it's, it's in, it's in, the, it's in very well lit. Uh, astronomies typically work, uh, back then worked in the dark, but she was, uh, she's here examining these photographic uh, plates and photographic spectra uh, of uh, galaxies and, um, so she wrote two papers, one, one of two papers that uh, showed dark matter. And she's, I think, one of the first people to coin the term dark matter. Uh, but not only that, she was very, uh, a very encouraging person um, to meet, really. It was uh, um, both my supervisor, Piet van der Krijt, and myself have stories of, uh, you know, feeling encouraged and, and uh, um, spurned on by to, to do our science uh, and so it is really uh, critical that when people do that uh, when you're you know working on some science project that you know you get some positive reinforcement and she was uh, she was very good at that and she was very uh, encouraging with young uh, scientists of any uh, any stripe so we know her and she's known for uh, the fact that galaxies rotate and um, uh, so she measured, uh, to, together with uh, Ford, uh, how um, stars rotate in, a gal in, in several galaxies, and including the one that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and so the yellow points here are where what we observe from starlight, or uh, the ionized gas, and the blue points are from uh, hydrogen used, uh, using radio. And so there were these two uh, teams, both of which were trying to figure out how galaxies move. And one of them, her team used um, the uh, uh, spectra, uh, spectra to, to see the, the stars move. And then there was a team in the Netherlands, Groningen, uh, um, chief among them, uh, that, was going, that was looking at the uh, radio emission uh, from 21 centimeter hydrogen um, line. And so you, both of them were sort of on the same, uh, were trying to find, were trying to solve the same problem, like how fast do galaxies actually rotate? And both of them found that, um, you can see this here, expected from the visible light, uh, if you just sum all the stars together, you get a certain amount of mass. And if you then rotate around that mass, we know that like from our uh, from our own planet, from our solar system, that you should go at a certain speed. So uh, the dash line is what you expect to see based on how much stuff there is really glowing there in the galaxy. And yet you see the points, right? So you, you observe much higher rotation. So there has to be extra stuff, extra matter 
sitting in this galaxy in order to to explain the uh, how fast it's rotating. And both of those teams saw the same thing at the same time in multiple galaxies. And so that's why it was such a clear piece of evidence for uh, dark matter. Um, so galaxy rotation. Galaxies do not rotate as a disk. They don't ro rotate as a CD. And if I talked, uh, if I'd given this talk 20 years ago, I'd say they don't ro uh, rotate like a vinyl, um, but uh, they don't rotate like the planets around our sun either. Um, that's because in the, in the solar system, all the mass is sitting in one spot. So the flat rotation means that, that they spin something between, um, uh, they, they spin something like not quite as a disk and not quite as the uh, solar system, and so there's somewhere in between, and that means that there's more stuff throughout the disk that's keeping um, the gas in a neat little rotation around, uh, around these planets, uh, around the center of the galaxy. And so um, I keep thinking of this, this is my daughter making uh, uh, a clay sculpture, and so anytime I think of galaxy rotation, I think of a pottery wheel. Uh, the further out you go, the faster it goes, and it's uh, a, a uh, a galaxy works a little bit like that, but um, not quite. It sort of flattens out. It doesn't keep spinning faster and faster. So the flatness of that rotation curve uh, tells us that it's not a solid disk uh, either. And so one of these uh, original rotation curves from back from her study from 1980, right? So you see Rubin et al. in 1980, and then you see a bunch of other studies as well, uh, is that uh, as you go out in radius, we have a x-axis and y-axis, we have how fast this galaxy is rotating. Now, the first thing is it's very, very flat, which means there's a lot of dark matter in this galaxy, but also I want you to notice what the unit on the y-axis is. It's it goes as fast as 250, 300 kilometers a second. So the gas is, is going, you know, this is a, uh, a very high value for galaxies. In fact, this is the highest value of all the galaxies in Vera Rubin's sample, and also in the, the other samples. Um, so, uh, uh, that the other group found. Uh, and the neat thing is that the blue line here is the radio, and the red one is what Fira Rubin found. And you know what? That's a pretty good agreement. So the fact that uh, two groups saw the same thing using different techniques made it such a solid result. Uh, so if you compare that with the solar system, for example, where is all the mass in the solar system? It's all the way in the sun, 98% of the uh, mass of the entire solar system is sitting in our sun, which means that we rotate around, uh, around it with, the, uh, with Kepler's laws. So if we see something rotating and it doesn't um, uh, go slow, the, the planets go slower and slower the further out you go, um, that's a declining rotation curve. But if we see this increasing, that means that there has to be even more mass enclosed with the next, uh, with the next particle that we're following. So um, this one galaxy uh, struck me as odd. And Vera Rubin wrote two papers in 1980. One of them, she talked about uh, dark matter. And this was just one of the galaxies in her sample. And um, I led a, a, a Hubble Space Telescope project. What does this have to do with the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, she wrote two papers. And the first one was, hey, look, dark matter. The other one noted uh, that this particular galaxy is really, really big. Um, it's not only rotating very fast, but also uh, is it just its diameter is just much larger than all the other galaxies that we typically looked at. So M81 is a, is a, is a favorite of, of um, sky viewers because you can actually see it with a small telescope. M51 is, I think, typically the first galaxy that we take a picture of as soon as we have a new camera. Uh, then there's the Sombrero Galaxy. We've got Andromeda, of course, an all-time all favorite. And M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy is another that's just, you know, these are all very photogenic galaxies, but they're all a lot smaller. If we put them on the same scale, we get this, this figure on the, on the right. And um, I, uh, I, I came across this paper again because it's in her book. Uh, and um, I just saw this picture and I was like, huh. I think we have a good Hubble picture of all of the ones on the right, except for the 
this one big galaxy, so why don't we go and do that? That would be make, we could do a few things at the same time, but I also think this would be a wonderful uh, tribute to uh, uh, R uh, Professor Rubin because, you know, we, we, it was, she was, her name was often mentioned as a potential uh, uh, winner of the Nobel, of a Nobel Prize. It sort of never quite um, materialized. And uh, yet this would be a nice um, tribute. So I thought that would be a, a, a good double um, target. Uh, of course, I don't just do this for the pretty picture, but the pretty picture is a very much a bonus. So this is the, the Hubble picture that we made, uh, and this is what I'll be talking about. So not so much the, the movement, but the, the, um, the stars that make up this galaxy. And you can see that it's uh, A, it's we now know that it is quite large, but it also looks pretty much like a normal Hubble galaxy picture. Um, it has uh, four spiral arms. Uh, those spiral arms have star formation going on in them. You can see that from the blue colors. You've got this really bright galactic star in front of it. And I think that's the reason that we didn't look at it with Hubble before, uh, because bright things with Hubble is always a little scary that we might damage the camera. Um, but we know what to do here, and so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fine. Um, and uh, you can see the little uh, background galaxies everywhere and the and, uh, companion uh, to the, uh, in the distance, uh, little elliptical galaxies. So you can actually zoom in. I always like doing this because um, this galaxy is, it's in Perseus, uh, and it is, um, it's actually visible with a you know small telescope. Uh, uh, one of the uh, backyard astronomers here in uh, Louisville has taken a picture after uh, we talked about it. And so this is what you can see. And then of course, we've now put in the Hubble picture because you know, we have a much better um, view of it. But uh, it is definitely something that you can uh, distinguish uh, with, a, with a small telescope. Um, so uh, how do you grow some, how do you grow them that big? Really, that was the, the question that I had, the scientific question, right? I, you can't just come up to the Hubble Space Telescope and say, hey, I'd like to take a pretty picture because, you know, that'd be nice. Um, we also have a science key case for this. Uh, and so if you have a disk this large, this extended, um, how do you grow a spiral galaxy that large? Um, because typically, if you get something of that mass, of that size, it is after smashing two mid-sized galaxies together. Um, those mergers leave a mark. Uh, this is a very symmetric, you saw those spiral arms, they're neatly arranged. Um, and so you would, uh, you would see a mark uh, if it was recent, and even if it happened a long time ago, we would see it in the, in the populations of globular clusters. So, um, and what we find is that it has relatively few globular clusters. But typically, you get a lot of globular clusters if you've made a galaxy out of lots of smaller galaxies. So this implies a very gradual accretion of mass. So it has acquired its mass by just taking, by snacking since the beginning of the universe. Um, let's see, this was a, uh, we had the press release, and the neat thing is that uh, once you have a press release, once there is a Hubble picture, people get to play with it. And so somebody, I have no idea how they did this, but they made this wonderful 3D effect where uh, they had the, the bright galaxy, the bright star uh, move back and forth. I'll, um, I'll talk a little bit about how we, uh, how we make a picture. How do you make a Hubble picture? Because we always see the end result. And the end result is pretty and beautiful, but it takes, it, it, that's not how it comes off the uh, camera. So uh, here's the part that I did, which is design the actual uh, observations. We have the, uh, the galaxy, um, not quite a little, you know, but 20 degrees off uh, from, um, the, from um, vertical um, here on the, on the picture as a grayscale and you see the bright star. Uh, so where the orange circle is, that's what where we should be centering on. And it's four separate pictures that we took with Hubble in three separate colors. So that's the, the green part is the wide field camera three. But as it turns out, Hubble has two cameras that can operate at the same time. So it's almost like you, uh, you hang two uh, big cameras off the same telescope and you split the, uh, you split the eyepiece, for example. 
And so uh, at the same time, I took one of the other squares. We have like two blue ones and two red ones. And those are the advanced camera for surveys. That's a camera that's been in operation since 2005. Um, and the Wildfield Camera 3 is the most recent addition to Hubble and the last addition to Hubble. Uh, and so I can take two pictures at, at the same time, but they always are uh, arranged like this. There's you know, one like this, and then the other is kind of like a diamond shape with respect to that. Um, and so those other two are also to catch some of the further globular clusters that are swarming around this, uh, this galaxy. Um, then you have to clean up your image. Uh, so you have issues like there is a gap. There's actually two cameras. There's a chip gap. So there's a gap in between. There's a uh, there's little reflections of bright things mean that there's um, a mirror effects. So you see those little figure of eights. That's not that's not real. That's a, that's a side effect from having some bright stars in this image. These things don't quite. You have to align them correctly, and you have these really bright diffraction spikes from some of the bright stars. So bright stars really are a challenge in order to do uh, some proper work here. But once you do, you end up with a black and white picture like this, because we took three pictures. We took one in the red, we took one in the blue, and we took one in the green. And so uh, this, these, these grayscale images then have to be combined in order to get the, uh, uh, to get the pretty picture that we saw. So. Uh, these do not quite, these uh, uh, people often ask me, it's like, oh, so is, is Hubble actually seeing blue, green, and red here? Or is there, are you fudging it? Like it feels like, to a lot of people it feels like lying. It's like, no, we just assign a color to where the closest is that we would perceive with our own eyes. And so the blue, green, and red are actually pretty close to what we see with our own eyes in, as blue, green, and red. Um, these are all in the optical. Um, and these are the three filters that we used. Um, and so we did this January, we did the image release. This is back when I was allowed to get out of the house. And uh, um, uh, we went to Hawaii to the whole team, well, most of the team went to Hawaii. We actually showed, we presented the picture uh, to the world, which was really uh, a fun thing to do. Uh, and then you get something really surreal for most, many astronomers. You, see, you watch your own work just travel through the internet uh, and uh, appear in all kinds of news sites. And for me personally, if you, have, if you don't know the astronomical picture of the day, this is, I think, one of the oldest continuously running websites on the internet. Um, and uh, it is a the NASA astronomical picture of the day. Um, when I started uh, undergrad, it was one of the first websites that, I don't know, existed that we could go and have a look at. And uh, so we, we typically make that our homepage. And then just, you know, the first thing you see was you would be greeted with a pretty picture of astronomy. So this was uh, uh, one of the things I, I had is like, when I grow up, I want to have one of my pictures as an astronomy, astronomy picture of the day and low. 20 years later, I did it. So, you know, that was, uh, that was, a, that was a big plus. Uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the aesthetic is still 1990s, late 1990s HTML, and they haven't changed that, and I'm fine with that. I, uh, my picture's on there. So, uh, of course, the Space Telescope being Space Telescope, they actually had like a large poster, and so this is my, uh, some of the members of my team. Uh, we had to take a selfie for that, of course, that, doesn't really grow old. In fact, that you see your own picture as tall as you are. So um, that was cool. We had an awesome picture um, and we have a problem. We have a conundrum because how do you make a bit of this galaxy, this galaxy, especially that big? Um, so this is the, cl the classic Hubble classification tuning fork or spoon, I don't know. Um, and so you have the reddish elliptical galaxies on the, it's my left. And so I think it's also your left. And then on the right, you have the S classes or the SB, which is, you know, spiral with a bar or S is just means uh, spiral galaxies. Uh, and then you have a regular, which is kind of the, um, the miscellaneous bin, I would call them. Uh, and so uh, the big galaxies happen and they're, ellipticals. Uh, the smaller galaxies 
are typically either regular or spiral. So how do I make a spiral galaxy that's basically the size of the biggest elliptical, one of the biggest ellipticals that we know? And so here I make a plot of um, the stellar mass at the, at the x-axis, so how much stars they're in. Uh, and I'm using a, a logarithmic, so uh, a billion stellar, uh, billion suns worth of mass is uh, the nine. And then uh, the 10 means it's 10 billion solar masses and 11, it's 100 billion solar masses. Uh, and so our, our, our friend, our galaxy is at 12 and a bit. So it is basically uh, a thousand billion solar suns worth of stars. That's a lot. And then uh, the star formation rate is um, not that high. Like a zero is one sun a year and it's doing a little better than that. So the grayscale says, shows you where nearby galaxies typically are. And so you have this like sequence of, of uh, galaxies that's, that I've kind of marked as star forming. And then you have the ones that are really not doing anything and they're kind of quiescent. And then we, there's a class of, of, of spirals known as super spirals. Um, kind of tucked in the top right there. And uh, initially I thought basically, well, UGC, 2885 Rubens galaxy could be the closest of these super spirals, right? So I had a look, uh, is it a super spiral? No, the super spirals are all the top, top right there. Um, but there is a problem with that. We've looked at all the super spirals and every single one of them has two nuclei or has, uh, I mean, the, the one, the second of the, from the left is, look at that, that's a car crash, right? These things are in the middle or right after a major collision with, uh, uh, with another galaxy. So yeah, they've survived as a disk galaxy, but only after uh, barely making it through uh, a massive collision. So, and they're also found in groups and denser environments. So really they're the central big galaxy of a group of galaxies and they've just mashed together with, uh, with one of the group members. And here, that really, that whole scenario does not fly for uh, Rubens galaxy. It is a huge disk, it's completely unperturbed. There's no evidence of any accretion. There's no second nucleus, there's nothing like that. So, and also it's nowhere near a group. So how do you get this? Um, and so this is a, the illustrious simulation. Um, whenever we're trying to figure out how a galaxy has evolved, we uh, essentially put a whole bunch of particles, gas and, uh, and dark matter and, and stars in a computer box and just run time forward because we're just impatient. Uh, and we want to see how this evolves. And uh, so the dark matter you see on the right, and we know this galaxy has a lot of dark matter because it's rotating really fast. So it has to be one of the bigger, you know, bigger bunches here. And then if we look at the galaxies, um, it has to be one of those spiral galaxies. They're even an equivalent. And um, it's pointing more and more towards that um, a galaxy like this has to be pretty rare to get this big and yet still be a disk galaxy without smashing into anything else that looks odd. Not impossible, clearly, but rare. Because typically, as you can see, anything big smashes into some, at least another one other galaxy, if not many more. And uh, the redshift at the Z at the top basically tells you um, it's counting down to Z is zero, which is the present day. And so as you can see, if, if you started with a whole bunch of galaxies and you're in a group, eventually, and eventually being probably in the past already, you end up with uh, all of them smashing together and becoming an elliptical. So that's what you see here. You, they end up being red and large and elliptical. Uh, and so another thing you can do is like, well, if, if it's the biggest thing going, what happens if I just have lots of little dwarf galaxies that uh, hit it? Well, for one thing, we'd, we'd still have a hard time coming up with such a neat and symmetric uh, spiral disk. Uh, look at just how many little dwarfs you, you'd hit it with, uh, but you'd also end up with like tidal tails and, and, and other debris around it. And prominent among that debris would be lots of globular clusters. All these dwarf galaxies have, relatively speaking, for their size, bring a bunch of globular clusters. So you'd expect uh, a lot of globular clusters 
these clumps of stars to survive this impact and then swarm around uh, this galaxy. So that's the ones that we were looking for. We're going to go look for these things. This is a globular cluster around our own Milky Way. Um, these are spherical clumps of stars. They're roughly all the same age. So uh, the good news is that uh, their color tells us exactly what age and metallicity where, where, where they're from. And so if we see multiple generations of globular clusters, we should see that in the colors, and this is why we took a color picture, in the colors of, these, um, of the globular clusters we find. And we should see, and if it's uh, the result of many mergers, we should see loads of them, right? Especially for the size of the galaxy. So we do find a lot of club, uh, clusters. We've identified the blue globular clusters versus the red globular clusters. And um, so these are the two colors we have. We call them blue for blue, and V for green, and I for red. Uh, and um, it's historical. So uh, we end up with two colors and we can actually separate out young clusters. These are things that just form just now out of gas. And then these older globular clusters that, um, that stick around forever. And then we can compare those to how, how bright they are and the color they have and compare them to the models we have from the clusters and just basically see how many of these things there are. So V magnitude is, tells you how bright it is and then just the sheer, the sheer number of them. And that should tell us how, how, how many of these global clusters there are for a given size. So we make the luminosity function, the absolute luminosity, these things are minus 10 to minus six, or it depends a little bit on what kind of galaxy you're in. And the funny thing is that uh, we now can compare them to M51, M81, because we have Hubble pictures of those things. We have the, the global cluster counts for those galaxies. And, M101 is a Milky Way or a little bigger galaxy. M81 is even bigger than a Milky Way. M51 is a little smaller and M83 is uh, about 10 times smaller than our, our Milky Way. Uh, NGC 6946 is the fireworks galaxy, so it's also pretty big. UGC, like Rubens galaxy, sits closer to the smaller galaxies, M51 and M82, it doesn't have a lot, and it doesn't have a lot of bright uh, globular clusters. So that's odd. And then we actually look at this plot. So this is all the globular cluster counts that we ever had. Uh, on the y-axis, on the x-axis, we've got uh, the luminosity of the galaxy, the absolute luminosity of the galaxy. Uh, and look, it's all the way to the left and the more negative we go the brighter this thing is you can actually see that at the top where we have the have the luminosity expressed in solar luminosities so 10 to the 10 uh, 10 billion suns worth of light coming off this thing uh, and then the relative number of globular clusters so we actually divide how many uh, global clusters do i get per million suns and so UGC 285, Rubens galaxy sits right at the bottom there. All the other galaxies that we know of, they have relatively many more globular clusters. So either something destroyed all of them, uh, which is unlikely because these things survive um, tidal interactions, they survive mergers, um, or it simply never made them and never acquired them. And so Rubens galaxy has been sitting there for as far as I can tell, the beginning of the universe and just slowly sit gas into, just ca caught a little bit of gas, turned it into stars, caught a little bit of gas, turned it into stars and never merged with anything. It was just really lucky it missed all of the traffic. Um, so uh, is this normal? And so it's otherwise, it's a perfectly normal spiral. It's just really, really big. On the x-axis, I've got stellar mass. On the y-axis, I've got uh, the size, the radius, and it's sitting right on where you expect it. All these dashed lines are, um, are maps, uh, are models by different authors, and it's sitting right where you expect it to be. In fact, I think most people have overlooked Rubens galaxy simply because it's always sitting right on the line. So it looks like it's just behaving like it should. It's nothing strange with it, but the, it is sitting right at the edge of whatever mass relation you have. Uh, and so I was kind of thinking like, well, is it rare? 
for its, so this is the y-axis is the absolute luminosity is, uh, is absolute luminosity, and then uh, the volume, and it's basically saying, yeah, it's pretty rare. It's 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 on the biggish side. Uh, you see that most of the galaxies in the in this survey um, are uh, much smaller. And then I looked at its environment and uh, the fourth nearest neighbor. So the y-axis is how common, how fast, how far away do I need to go to find its fourth nearest neighbor? And this is a very useful, you can actually do this exercise if you're in a crowded room, although don't be in a crowded room right now. Uh, or you can next do this uh, in, your, in your house, for example. My first nearest neighbor will be uh, some of my family members, whoever is the closest in the next room, for example, right? So it'll be a few dozen feet at best. How far are my first neighbor, nearest neighbors? My second nearest neighbor, well, we live in a house with four people, so the second uh, nearest neighbor will be again in the house. And the third nearest neighbor will still be in the house. But my fourth nearest neighbor will be my neighbor. The like, actual, the fourth person next to me will be in another house. And suppose I live in the suburbs, that tells you immediately how far the other house is, right? So that'll be quickly 100 feet or 150 feet. Uh, yet, if you're living in a rural area, uh, that could be several miles, right? So the distance to the fourth per nearest thing near me, the fourth ne person near me, uh, immediately will tell you whether or not I live in the suburbs, in the rural area, or in a uh, apartment complex, right? So the fourth nearest neighbor in an apartment complex could be just the next apartment over. So it's still pretty close. Um, so the fourth nearest neighbor is a way to say how crowded is its environment? And it doesn't seem for its absolute magnitude seems to be very, um, very, very lonely. Um, <clears throat> so how do you grow a galaxy like this? It is much more massive and, and, and extended. Two things, right? It has lots of mass, lots of dark mass, dark matter mass, and it's, uh, it's got lots of stars for any typical spiral galaxy. And so the trick is how do you grow a disk this big? Literally 10 times, you can fit 10 Milky Ways in this thing lengthwise. And so how do you do that? Um, and mergers leave a mark and we don't see that. Uh, and it has very, very few globular clusters, <clears throat> especially for its size. So it really implies that it has sipped rather than gobbled. Uh, and so it has acquired uh, its mass very, very slowly. <coughs> so that is the th first thing that we found. We're, um, we're hoping to, um, to find more. And this is kind of like the cheat sheet, how fast, how many stars do we, does it form? But um, this is what we found so far. I'm really curious about what's lurking in its center now. <coughs> Excuse me. Because um, if you're this big, uh, the center of your galaxy should contain a supermassive black hole. We have the black hole in the center of our Milky Way. We have all the big galaxies that we have a look at have millions of solar mass black holes, sometimes billions of solar mass black holes. Um, <clears throat> does this thing even have a black hole or did it never form one? And so the next thing I want to do is have a very, have a closer look at the right at the center of this galaxy, see if there's a, uh, a supermassive black hole lurking there, or if uh, it never made one, because that would fit with the story that it very gradually acquired every, all the mass and never really grew a monster in its uh, in its belly either. All right. Well, if you want to have more questions, that's my contact information. But if you want to ask me questions now, please do. Uh, I love questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, Benny, for the for the talk, uh, in lieu of an applause, we, you can use your reactions uh, in Zoom to to give virtual claps for our speaker today. Thank you for that wonderful talk on Rubens Galaxy. Uh, so at this point, uh, if you have questions for the speaker, please post them in the chat, and we will uh, take questions. We're open for questions now, and then. In the meantime, I may ask our graduate student, William Matsko, to ask the first question. Um, uh, uh, we actually have one coming in. So uh, the first question comes from uh, Ava Schwartz. How would it have been possible for this galaxy to form without a black hole at its center? 
So um, we're a galaxy this big probably started growing very shortly after the Big Bang. Um, and um, <clears throat> sorry, I, I do want to put this up. I'm here in Louisville. Um, and so um, I hope that's okay. The uh, um, a, a galaxy. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, a, a big, a big, um, a big galaxy like this must have been growing since pretty much right after the Big Bang. Right, the Big Bang happens. You see this uh, it, it, about three hundred thousand years later. You see the cosmic microwave background. And there's these little cold spots that start growing uh, the dark, uh, the dark matter um, clumps. And so, if it's this big, it must have gotten its start very early on and if it's that early on it must have formed some of the very first stars and the very we think the very first stars must have been really large uh, and that instantly formed after their first explosions uh, some seed black holes and so if you have if you're one of the first galaxies off the bark and you have a, a black hole sitting in pretty much you know it'll spiral down the um, uh, the dark matter potential and sit in the center and then it has basically 13 billion years to gobble things up um, so it, it tends to grow it tends to uh, 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 spiral to the center and then grow by acquisition the thing is uh, typically when you have a big dark uh, sorry a big um, supermass a supermassive black hole a million uh, suns uh, worth of mass and sitting in the center it also has what you call an active galactic nucleus and especially this big uh, the active galactic nuclei uh, spit out um, uh, these uh, these jets and uh, we should be seeing that and yet we don't and so it's oddly absent the, uh, the active galactic nucleus. And so I'd like to have a closer look. Uh, it might just be there, but again, like the rest of the, uh, rest of the galaxy, quite quiescent and not, uh, not spitting fire. But some of the, many of the other mass, uh, supermassive black holes in galaxies this size are spitting um, uh, jets out. Sorry for the long answer, but yes, this is a, a weird one. Well, that's, a, that's a great question. Um... Uh, I am perplexed by this galaxy, so it doesn't seem like you have a, a have found the answer yet as to why this galaxy is so large. Is, is that right? I mean, no, and, and mystery um, of sorts. It is very much a mystery. If you make any galaxy, if you look at any galaxy uh, that is a thousand billion solar masses of stars, it would look like an elliptical. It's, it's very rare that you get that far and not hit another galaxy. I mean, our own Milky Way is going to merge with the, um, uh, the Andromeda galaxy in, oh, I don't know, two billion years. Uh, and so we'll end up in about five billion years with an elli living in an elliptical galaxy. Um, that was actually one of our questions. <laughs> ah, okay. Answer. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. It, so so for so when Andromeda and the Milky Way do collide in a couple billion years, will it lead to a giant spiral like this or an elliptical? What are the simulations predict? What are they predicting? The predictions are very much an elliptical. In fact, it's very hard to keep your disk uh, to to keep a disk going uh, because it's um, as soon as you hit it on sideways with another disk, you. Um, you don't rotate anymore. You basically randomize everybody's uh, orbit. And so instead of being a neatly rotating thing, you have randomly moving stars. And so you end up in a giant ball, which is really what ellipticals are. Great. Uh, so we have another question from uh, Theta, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, they might not um, uh, understand the connection here, but why do we have a bail fund slide, if you're willing to uh, take that? Uh, yeah, so I'm in Louisville, uh, and the, uh, there are currently uh, many protests going on, and I thought, um, I can't do anything because I'm, I'm stuck in the house, but I thought, well, if, if you do want to, to do something about the protests that are happening here, uh, you can have a, you can donate to the bailout, uh, the, the and, bail and, fund. And can you, would you mind sharing what's special about Louisville, Kentucky in particular with regards to the protests? Right. So uh, on Wednesday, we had the um, announcement by the Kentucky Attorney General that uh, there, there was only one 
charge for the police officer who had shot Brianna Taylor in her apartment. And that has uh, it's been quite upsetting for many people here. Uh, and th so they are protesting that. And, and that, that uh, took place in the, in the um, uh, this is all here in Louisville, yeah. Yeah, if they don't like to share that this, this discussion is irrelevant oh. and unrelated to this uh, lecture, uh, but uh, we as scientists uh, are human and involved in our society. And uh, we, we think that it's important for scientists to speak out in support of our fellow uh, citizens. All right, so for the next question we have, um, how would it have been possible for this galaxy to form without a black hole at its center? I, my money is still there that there is one. Um, but let's see if I can get back to my picture, or at least the, here we go. Um, so uh, you can see that it is mostly disc. So uh, that's, that's the other part of the mystery. Um, <clears throat> even if you'd had something like um, Andromeda has a fairly, has a bigger bulge. It has the yellow part in the middle here is relatively speaking quite small. Uh, and we know that the size of the, the bulge, the little, ye the, the yellow part in the center of the galaxy it, is scales with uh, how big the supermassive black hole is. And so the fact that this thing only has a very small bulge predicts at least that there should be only a small relatively small. I say small, but you know, something that's a million solar masses. I, I have trouble saying the word small about that, but it is relatively small uh, supermassive black hole. So maybe it's there, but not um, active. It's not uh, ingesting gas. But if you look closer at this uh, image, you can see that there's still dust. There's dusty, these, these brown stripes, and uh, you see it swirling towards the center. So it's not like it doesn't have gas to, to accrete. Um, so I'm very curious if there is one. And maybe you can have, I mean, if you'd asked me in grad school, can you make a galaxy this big without making an elliptical? I would have said no, because you know, you, in order to make a, this many stars put together, you have to put two smaller galaxies together. But apparently, you can do it. Nature has found a way. So maybe it's also found a way not to have a, a supermassive black hole. These are two things that might be linked. Um, if it's this big, it usually stops forming stars altogether. Yet here it is, neat and blue, neatly rotating. Beautifully symmetric, um, four arms. This should be a galaxy that's only like half or well, 10 times less uh, smaller in size. It looks like it's you know smaller uh, galaxy, uh, galaxy brethren. Uh, and so how did this happen? Just hulked out for no reason. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm very curious how this worked. Oh, that's wonderful. Cool. Okay. so. Um uh, feel free to ask more questions in the chat. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to our graduate students to give us a view of our campus telescope and give you a tour for tonight. Unfortunately, the humidity is over 85% outside here in Fairfax, Virginia, so we won't be, uh, be able to open the dome. Uh, but um, uh, we'll go ahead and share your screen, uh, Justin, and we'll get the show started. Okay, uh, thank you, Peter, uh, and thank you, uh, Benet. I uh, really enjoyed your talk. I hope uh, everyone else did too. Um, so um, I think there is one more question that just popped up in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and uh, we'll take that question a little bit. Uh, maybe when we're doing a telescope move, and and uh, so William, go ahead and uh, introduce what they're looking at first, and then we'll come back uh, to the question in the chat from uh, Evan. Okay, sure. So uh, let me just go ahead and minimize uh, this bit first. So what we're just looking at here is a, a black uh, desktop with a bunch of icons. And what we're uh, seeing is actually a computer that is located on top of Research Hall, which is a building at a George Mason University. So we are remotely connected to that computer via TeamViewer, and it allows us to uh, uh, remotely uh, observe uh, with the telescope from the comfort of our own home. So uh, part of the reason uh, we can uh, do this remote observation is that we have a set of webcams on the roof 
that uh, give us a live uh, footage of what's actually going on up there. So if we just open this up, uh, we see that we have uh, three cameras. So starting in the top uh, right, we have a live view of our control room. So you can see we have a couple of computers uh, towards uh, the left. Uh, that's the main computer uh, that we're connected to right now. And then we also have a second computer uh, down here. And in theory, uh, the, uh, that second computer is just an exact clone of our main computer where we do all of our software testing and uh, Windows update testing. So for those of you who don't know, uh, a few months ago, we had a wonderful Windows 10 update that screwed up uh, some of our drivers and uh, rendered our observatory uh, completely useless for uh, about a month or two, I think. So uh, we've had bad luck with Windows updates, so we do all of our software testing uh, and whatnot uh, on that second computer. So uh, as I said, this is the control room, and if uh, we were observing in person, uh, or if uh, people were going to be observing in person, this is the room where they would spend most of their time in. So they would uh, just uh, get on the target and start collecting data and then uh, hang out the rest of this night, hang out the rest of the night in, the, in this uh, fairly small room. Uh, we all tell ourselves that we're gonna be productive and get homework uh, done during this time, but we usually end up just watching movies and random YouTube rabbit holes. So in the bottom right, uh, we have a, a no signal. That camera is in a box, so we're not really expecting a signal from it. In the uh, bottom left, uh, what we have is an outside view of the telescope and dome, uh, more so the dome rather. So that doorway is to give a sense of scale about uh, six and a half feet. So um, yeah, so nothing, too interesting to see uh, on the outside here. Well, it looks, uh, looks like you have a spider trying to take up residence in the upper right corner. Oh, uh, yeah, view. it does look like you a, see little... a little wiggly white line. That's actually a spider web. Uh, we'll have to go clear that out uh, maybe over the weekend. It looks like they left the elevator light on in the lobby, so I'll have to go back and turn that off the next time we have a clear night. Yeah, hey, it looks go like back to you, Will. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it looks like they keep uh, leaving that light on. But uh, another thing you can actually uh, notice here is we have this kind of uh, structure that's on uh, top of the dome, and that is the shutter. So if we would uh, actually open the dome, uh, what we would see is uh, this, uh, you can see how it's kind of segmented into two parts. Uh, the top part, the part on the top would just retract back and over uh, the dome, and then this bottom part would uh, swing out and we would uh, be able to uh, take uh, some nice images of the night sky, but of course uh, that can't happen tonight. So, and then finally, uh, we have our telescope. So if we just zoom in on this, so this is a 0 0.8 meter reflector telescope. So when someone says that a telescope is a 0 0.8 meters, what they're generally referring to is the diameter of the primary mirror. So uh, for those who don't know metric very well, 0 0.8 meters is about 32 inches. And uh, relatively speaking, uh, it's a fairly sizable telescope. It's uh, definitely uh, something your amateur astronomer would absolutely love to have. But in the stage of the largest uh, telescopes in the world, this uh, telescope is actually fairly small. Uh, the largest telescopes in the world are actually about uh, 10 times uh, the size of this telescope. But nonetheless, uh, we can still do some interesting work here. Um, and I will talk a little bit about the research we do uh, later. But anyways, uh, earlier I said that this was a reflecting telescope. And what that uh, essentially means is we use mirrors instead of lenses in our telescope. So you can see uh, that we're looking at the big, uh, the, the primary mirror uh, right now. So that shiny disc in the back is the primary mirror that's 32 inches. And so what's gonna happen is light will come in from uh, the great beyond and you know, outer space, and it will go through the tube and strike the primary mirror, and it will go up and strike this uh, secondary mirror. So that's the thing that's being held by those four struts. And then light will bounce off that secondary mirror. And you can see that in the middle of the uh, primary mirror, we have this uh, hole. And the light will go through the hole and it will bounce off yet another mirror, which is a diagonal reflector mirror. And it will bounce uh, the light into uh, the, one of the four uh, instruments that we have on the back of the telescope. 
So, um, a few fun facts about the telescope. It was installed, actually not that long ago, it was installed in 2010, I believe 2010 or 2011, and is about uh, $300,000 uh, for the telescope itself. Uh, the dome is about $80,000. And uh, between 2017 and 2019, we've poured in about $150,000 worth of upgrades to it. Uh, for some reason, a lot of people like to estimate the price of the telescope as being in the millions. Uh, I wish it was. It would be wonderful. But uh, yeah, it's not nearly uh, that expensive, but it's still uh, a hefty uh, chunk of money. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask uh, Justin to go ahead and uh, flip the telescope over so we can take a look at the instruments that are attached to the telescope. And while that is happening, I think it would be a good uh, time to uh, ask uh, that question that was uh, posed in chat. Yeah, great. I'll take that question and ask it of uh, uh, Bennett. But uh, one thing I do want to say is what you're looking at right now is a virtual view of the night sky. And this is actually the software that we use to control the telescope. And we're going to watch the telescope as it turns and brings the different parts of it into view. So uh, the question for our speaker uh, related to the galaxy, is it growing at the same rate or is it slowing down or speeding up? Like, I guess, do we have a time derivative on the rate of growth? It's a fantastic question. Um, also, I have no idea. So uh, it's, uh, this is the plot that you'd have to look at. Um, and if I uh, grow a galaxy at the rate of um, a solar mass, let's say uh, three solar masses a year, and I've been doing that for a billion years, uh, that's three billion uh, solar masses. Uh, so that would put me right about here. Uh, I'm not sharing the screen, so that's not helping. Um, yeah. Sorry, if I can no, see okay. it, everybody can see it, right? So yeah. um, here we go. So this is the plot that we were talking about. Uh, and so if you, uh, if you would grow a galaxy for uh, a billion years at the rate that uh, this galaxy is growing, uh, it would be a 10 to the 9 solar mass galaxy. So it would be right at the, where the star forming, it says star forming. Um, if I do that for the age of the universe, that's 10 billion years, I'd still only be, you know, at the 10, at the 10 mark at the, on, the, uh, the wax, uh, on the x axis and, uh, and back up there. It is not just one, but two orders of magnitude bigger than that. So it must have been growing faster in the, uh, in the past. It's coming down from a growth spurt, I guess, um, because for its size, it's not growing particularly fast. Uh, but I was, I'm really flabbergasted to, to, to imagine how you would uh, grow a galaxy and still look this, um, this symmetric, this, you know, undisturbed and, you know, crank it up to 10, uh, 10 times that star ratio. It would be look pretty blue. That's for, that's for sure. Excellent question. Really good. Yeah. I'm going to ask a follow up later. Uh, do we want to switch back to the view of the uh, telescope? Justin, if you can share your screen again. Stop sharing. Hang on. No, yeah, you're okay. We'll, we'll it'll flip over on its own. I think you might have to stop sharing. There we go. Now it's working. All right, William, the uh, floor is yours. Okay, great. So uh, what we're looking at is just the other side of the telescope now. So you can see we have uh, quite a few uh, interesting uh, instruments uh, going on there. So I'll first uh, start with the um, one in the uh, kind of upper left dish that uh, has these uh, almost like uh, bars uh, coming off of it. And that's uh, one of the newest additions to our telescope. It's a spectrograph. So what that does is effectively just takes in light and it will split it into its uh, constituent uh, components. So if you uh, have seen a white light passing through a prism, it disperses out into a rainbow of colors. That's basically what the spectrograph does. And it allows us to look at particular uh, wavelengths of light. So as far as I know, we actually haven't uh, gotten the chance to use this yet, but it should be a very uh, interesting tool to use uh, once we start using it. Uh, the other instrument that we have uh, going uh, towards the right is our CCD or charge coupled device. 
So uh, this is the main uh, imaging uh, hardware that we use. So this big uh, black, um, almost like a rectangle uh, shape is actually a filter wheel and that holds uh, seven filters. Uh, so it enables us to look at the sky in particular uh, wavelengths. So for instance, uh, if we want to look at the sky at red wavelengths, we would just put up the red filter. If we wanted to look at bluer wavelengths, uh, we would put, uh, put up the blue filter. But this, uh, the CCD is just effectively a very uh, high res camera. It's a 4096 by 4096 uh, pixel array. So that translates to about 16.8 uh, megapixels, which is fairly high resolution. And it allows us, uh, the, so the, this uh, CCD allows us to see objects that are uh, much fainter uh, than the human eye could see. So uh, across the CCD, uh, we have this little eyepiece. And if we were there in person, uh, we would actually uh, take a look uh, through the eyepiece, assuming you know, the weather was good. And uh, we could you know, see uh, generally Jupiter and Saturn are wonderful targets. Um, but with the CCD, uh, we can actually uh, take a look at a variety of targets that our uh, eyes could not see if we were looking through the eyepiece. And that's because the CCD can effectively uh, open its uh, shutter for uh, some arbitrary period of time and collect a bunch of light. And that enables it to see incredibly uh, faint objects that are well past uh, the limit of the human eye. So uh, the human eye can see about to uh, sixth magnitude and the uh, CCD can see, I think we've gotten out to about 18th or 19th magnitude. So very, very faint. Um, and if the weather was good, we would be taking live images, but unfortunately uh, we can't. But instead, we have uh, some images that we have taken beforehand of Jupiter and Saturn and uh, some other galaxies uh, that we can show you uh, now. So before I move on with that, uh, are there any questions about the telescope or anything in general about the observatory? Well, I was going to ask if we could watch the dome spin a little bit. Can I, do you mind if I... Um... Oh, not at all. Yeah, go ahead. First spin so people can take a look. Okay. So um, I'm just going to do a quick little little show here. We can go back to the full three color, uh, yeah, three panel image and uh, we can watch the, the dome spin. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move it to its home position. We're not connected, so let me go ahead and connect to it. Uh, and move it to its home position. And we're going to watch the dome spin just to see that it is a, a fully functioning uh, 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 R2-D2 unit. <laughs> Looks like uh, there's some domes I think I've heard that have been painted to look like the little Star Wars uh, character. And you can see it turning here uh, live in, uh, in both views. We're not going to open it tonight unfortunately but there you can see this whole uh, dome turning and then I'll, I'll go ahead and bring it back to the, the uh, park position and hand it back off to uh, Will and Justin. Okay, great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it's it's definitely neat to see the dome spin. Uh, if you're in there in person, it does make a very cool uh, kind of spacey sound that you would find in some kind of a Star Wars or Star Trek uh, film. Um, so uh, with that said, um, I don't think there are any questions about the uh, telescope or the observatory itself. So let me go ahead and move on to uh, some of the images that we have uh, taken beforehand. So let's go ahead and start with uh, Jupiter. So one of the things uh, to note uh, about uh, our images of uh, Jupiter and Saturn is that they're not uh, the best uh, quality you might uh, think they would and the reason you would think they would be and the reason for that is our telescope is actually just a little bit too big to be taking uh, really good images of planets. So uh, Jupiter and Saturn and pretty much the other planets are very very bright and what happens is they quickly uh, saturate the CCD and it's hard to capture uh, very intricate details as you could with uh, 
a smaller telescope. But nonetheless, uh, we do have a very uh, nice image of Jupiter here, or relatively nice image of Jupiter here. Um, so Jupiter itself is the giant of our solar system. It's about 300 times the mass of the Earth and about 1,300 times the volume of the Earth, uh, sitting at a comfortable 600 million miles away from us. So Jupiter is composed mainly of hydrogen and helium. And one of the uh, features that you can uh, see on Jupiter, even in this image, is that it has uh, some kind of banded structure to it. So uh, the light areas are called zones and the darker areas are called belts. So the difference in the colors is actually due to temperature differences and chemical composition uh, in the bands. So in the uh, belts, the, uh, the darker areas, the gas is sinking and in the lighter zone areas, the gas is rising. So the bands that are next to each other, uh, they have uh, alternating uh, winds. So these bands are kind of grinding against each other. So that's one of the striking images or striking uh, features of Jupiter that you uh, kind of immediately notice. And one of the other features, uh, something you probably are all uh, more familiar with, is uh, Jupiter's Great Red Spot, which is a giant storm that has been raging for the past uh, few hundred years. So that storm itself is about two to three times the diameter of Earth and has wind speeds of up to about 350 miles per hour. Uh, I do believe in recent years that the uh, Great Red Spot has been shrinking a little bit, but nonetheless it's still a very powerful storm that's been raging for the last uh, uh, few hundred years. So that is Jupiter, and let me, oops, let me go ahead um, and switch to uh, some, an image of uh, Jupiter's moons that we did not take ourselves. Uh, Jupiter's moons, uh, as you might imagine, do not look much more than some, uh, uh, dots of light uh, with our telescope, but we can uh, just pick some images that were taken by probes that have actually visited uh, those bodies. And what we see here are uh, the four Galilean moons. Uh, when Galileo discovered uh, these uh, four moons in about the early 1600s, uh, it was actually quite a revolutionary discovery because at the time, you know, people uh, still thought that the sun, uh, or the earth rather, was the center of the universe and everything was revolving around the Earth. But when Galileo uh, made this observation, it showed at the very least, you have uh, other bodies that are not orbiting Earth, but rather orbiting this uh, planet that's, uh, yeah, this, this other planet. So uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, the moon, the largest moon, Ganymede. So this is uh, the largest moon in our solar system. It's actually a, a little bit bigger than Mercury. And it's the only known moon to have an appreciable uh, magnetic field. It also has an internal ocean uh, that could hold uh, more water than all of Earth's oceans combined. So most of Ganymede is composed of rocky material uh, and water ice. So uh, if we move on, uh, we have Callisto next. And this is uh, one of the oldest and most heavily cratered uh, surfaces in the solar system. I like to say it looks a little bit like a disco ball. But one thing you can uh, kind of infer from that heavily cratered surface is that there's not a lot of uh, plate tectonics uh, going on on Callisto. So it's kind of uh, not very geologically active. Otherwise, we would uh, not see as many craters because there would be stuff replenishing that. And then uh, next up we have Io, and Io is definitely one of the interesting, uh, one of the more interesting uh, moons visually, because it looks like uh, a piece of cheese I found in the back of my fridge. Uh, so what's actually happening there is you have a bunch of, uh, or you have a lot of volcanic activity that's called by tidal heating between Jupiter and the other Galilean moons. So what's happening is that Jupiter is tugging on Io one way, the other moons are tugging on Io the other way, and that causes it to be incredibly volcanically active. So, sorry. So the surface as a result is covered in sulfur and uh, sulfur dioxide frost. 
And that's what's giving it its unique uh, yellow and reddish uh, colors. So Io is uh, one of the most, or I think the most, uh, volcanically active uh, body in the solar system. And what's really neat is we actually, uh, when the New Horizons probe uh, was on its way to Pluto, it actually took a uh, picture of a uh, volcano uh, spewing out uh, stuff on Jupiter. And I believe we have a GIF of that. Uh, let's see, where did that get to? Yeah, Io eruption. So this is a, a picture of an actual volcanic eruption on Io from the New Horizons uh, spacecraft. So you can see that in real time puffing out, which is pretty, pretty neat. Okay. And then lastly, we have Europa. So let me go ahead and pull up that image. So uh, one of the most uh, striking things you'll see about this is that it's a fairly uh, smooth surface. So it does have uh, some plate tectonics going on. And let's see, what else do I want to say about this? So Europa is the smallest of the four uh, Galilean moons. And it also has a bunch of these uh, cracks that are uh, snaking across its surface. And as far as I know, uh, we don't really know why those uh, cracks are present. So that is uh, Jupiter and its uh, four moons. So what I can do next is move on to Saturn, unless there are any questions on Jupiter. OK. So let's go ahead and pull up an image of Saturn. And again, uh, it's a little fuzzy, a little faint and far away, but nonetheless, we can still tell that's a uh, Saturn. And uh, of course, uh, the most uh, striking thing you'll see uh, with Saturn is its uh, ring structure. So uh, Saturn itself is, again, a gas giant like Jupiter, mainly composed of hydrogen and helium. It's about 750 times the volume of Earth, about 100 times the mass of Earth. And it's uh, the least dense planet in our solar system. If you had a bathtub, you know, that was big enough and you had water in it, uh, Saturn would float in that bathtub. So uh, Saturn's ring system is mostly composed of water, ice, and rocky debris and dust particles. So the rings themselves are not actually solid. And the rings are probably from destroyed uh, moons or asteroids and comets that just uh, coalesced uh, in Saturn's a gravitational field. So Saturn does have banding uh, similar to Jupiter, but it's less prominent. Uh, you can also, uh, if you look at Saturn uh, at the North Pole, you'll see that there's actually a very uh, interesting hexagonal storm. And the cause, I believe, of that storm is unknown. So, but it's a very, very uh, strong uh, geometric figure. It's a very clear cut hexagon, which is a very striking. I wish uh, we should have had, we should have an image of that in here, but I don't think we do. Um, so, tight, or sorry, uh, Saturn has uh, more than 80 moons, and uh, a couple of them I'd like to talk about are uh, Titan and Enceladus. So, let me see if I have pictures of those. Uh, let's see. Mm. Yeah, they're there. And solid this and Titan. Yeah, yeah. Don't see. Oh, yeah, there's, there's Titan. Okay. So, um, Titan is a, a very, very interesting moon because it's the only uh, moon uh, in our solar system to have an appreciable atmosphere. And effectively, Titan has liquid uh, rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. But unlike on Earth, uh, these, uh, these flowing rivers and whatnot are made of methane and ethane. So it's possible that there could be some non-carbon-based life on the surface of Titan. Uh, so Titan itself also has a salty subsurface ocean. So it's kind of like... Uh, a weird clone of Earth that is made up of methane and ethane. 
So lastly, uh, there's uh, Enceladus, which is uh, Saturn's uh, sixth largest moon, but it's covered in a very fresh uh, layer of ice, and as a result, it's very uh, reflective. So geysers are actually spraying out uh, subsurface ocean water out into space, and that's uh, landing back down on Enceladus and coating it. And some of it goes into Saturn's rings. But what's interesting is that uh, if you analyze uh, the water that uh, Enceladus has spewed out, it has a lot of chemical ingredients that are uh, common in life that we see on Earth. So that is Titan and Enceladus and Saturn. So next, uh, and I think uh, the last object uh, I'll show, is a galaxy. So what we'll take a look at is the Whirlpool Galaxy. We have two images of this. One is black and white and one is colored. Okay, here we go. So the Whirlpool Galaxy, uh, otherwise known as M51, um, it's a spiral galaxy and you can see that it's interacting with a smaller galaxy. So this uh, galaxy uh, pair is about uh, 23 million uh, light years from Earth, about 75,000 light years in diameter, and it has a very uh, strong uh, spiral structure. So this is a common target uh, for astronomers who are interested in studying uh, the dynamics of emerging galaxies because these two galaxies uh, are actually you know, physically emerging with each other. And if we zoom in uh, on these galaxies, you can see that we have uh, one of the arms of the main galaxy appearing to kind of blend in and uh, merge with this uh, smaller galaxy here. So this, uh, let me talk a little bit more uh, about the uh, images. So uh, one of the things you'll notice uh, in the bright image and to a lesser extent on the colored image is that we have these kind of uh, donut features that are uh, going on in the image. So that is just because this is a raw unprocessed image and what you're looking at with those donuts is actually dust on our CCD. So we can uh, edit those uh, donuts out uh, with some simple image processing, but we just haven't uh, done that yet. So the other thing to note is that um, to make a colored image, it's uh, not as difficult as you might think. So all of the images we take uh, with the CCD, no matter what filter we use, uh, will come out uh, black and white. So if we have our, if we put our red filter on, we take an exposure, we're not going to see a red image. We're going to see a black and white image. Uh, similarly, if we toss a blue filter on, we're just going to get a black and white image. And the way we actually uh, make a colored image, like the one on the left, is we take uh, different, uh, we take uh, images of the galaxy in different uh, wavelengths of light. So typically we use a red, uh, green, and blue light. So we'll take an exposure uh, once in each of those filters. And then we will stack uh, the images uh, together and make a colored image uh, like you see on the left. So that's the kind of general idea behind uh, image processing. You're just combining three uh, images into one to make uh, that image. Uh, without going into too many details. So this, yeah, so that's mainly uh, what I have to say about uh, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. So um, I guess one other thing I could say um, is uh, the spiral arms that you see here, uh, fairly well defined. Uh, in those uh, regions, you have lots of uh, star formation going on. So you can see they're actually uh, quite blue. So blue is uh, indicative of uh, star forming uh, regions that are going on. Um, so lastly, uh, I think since we do have a little bit of uh, time, I'll well, go I think, ahead. Are we, uh, yeah, we actually have a, a couple of questions. So oh, we do? I think oh, we could okay. wrap up with a couple of questions. Uh, so we had a comment uh, on uh, forbidden dust donuts. <laughs> 
Uh, but we had a question about the optical design aperture and focal length of the telescope. Uh, and just to answer that question, it's, a, it's an optical guidance systems uh, telescope, a small company uh, in the Northeast that makes these. There are a few companies that make these kind of mid-class telescopes kind of straddling the boundary between amateur telescopes and professional telescopes. Uh, and uh, it has an aperture of 32 inches. Uh, that was uh, uh, the mirror, primary mirror diameter is 32 inches, about 0 0.8 meters and the focal length uh, it's about seven times that, although the, the way the mirror is designed, the length of the tube is a lot shorter. Uh, but uh, specifically, if you're familiar with camera terminology, the F number or um, uh, the F stop of the telescope is uh, F7. Um, and so uh, at this point in time, I'd like to uh, thank um, our speaker for joining us tonight and with a question, if I can. Um, so just got me thinking of how hard the system is to deal with. Instead of looking at how you might have controlled its formation, has anyone thought about how they might have quenched it in a novel way, some type of quenching mechanism that might have uh, halted that massive star formation growth at some point? So at this mass range, this, this size, uh, the typical way that we would uh, stop a galaxy from forming stars, and it hasn't stopped, right? It is, it is spread out, and it's uh, all over the disk. Uh, and if you put everything together, it's actually you know, pretty, it's still producing stars. Um, good enough for a spiral. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the typical way to stop uh, galaxies from forming more stars is to stop the gas from flowing in and for that you need um, a supermassive black hole again like the AGN has to switch on and blow everything out um, and so that's what you would expect um, I don't know it, it might be that it's just isolated enough that it doesn't it's kind of running out of fuel it's running out of gas very very slowly uh, I can imagine that happens, but uh, we would have to look at this in um, a couple more in, in, in with uh, some of the newer telescopes that we, we can uh, get our hands on. So for instance, the, uh, the Rubin, Vera Rubin Observatory uh, will be very good at uh, low surface brightness. Unfortunately, this galaxy is in the north, so it can't get to it. Um, and the square kilometer array would look at its uh, gas content in much more detail, but that's also, that's going to be in Africa. Um, that's a telescope that starts in uh, Cape Town and basically ends in Kenya. Um, so maybe, maybe we'll get some more information on, on how, on its history, because I really like the question about like, how did you, did it always form stars this quickly? And, and if you want to do that, you have to look at the, uh, the stellar populations to, to have a look at it in even more detail. Um, I will be doing that. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep digging. Oh, well, good luck with that mystery. That's a, thank that's you. a good one. Uh, so uh, thank you again for joining us tonight from Kentucky. Absolutely. And thank you all for joining tonight's session. And this will be posted to YouTube and on our website and social media. Uh, eventually. And um, good night, everyone. And hopefully come back in two weeks to join us for Clear Skies, hopefully. And there's a survey link in the chat for feedback. We'd appreciate it if you fill it out. And we'll see you again next time. Our next speaker will be Dr. Varj Rangorian from NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. Good night, everyone.